and I think that's the my intention behind everything, the freeing of humanity on all levels. All of us are an unlimited, immortal creator, just, just like God's source. Unlimited, immortal creator. The only way, the only way to stop an unlimited, immortal creator is to make each and every one of these unlimited, immortal creators stop themselves. started going through the book and you know what really struck me right from the start was with memories of how quite frankly brain bending our conversation was last time because that's where you're going you're going to behind the facade of who we are to the truth of who we are and that can be a bit of a shock sometimes for people you know we're not used to it necessarily thinking from the same perspective as you are reading the book i thought hey this is really simple this is really good stuff this is so simple to assimilate to understand and and then i started doing the diarizing exercise myself <laughs> and i thought hang on hang on um is this as simple as I think it is, or am I getting lost in it? And I'm kind of in a space where I, I've had some really interesting revelations, mm. but I'm still kind of thinking too much. We'll talk. We'll get onto the the problems of thinking a bit later sure. on. But could you just highlight what your what your intention was with the book to start with and and we'll go from there. Yeah, I mean, I could sum it up in one word, freedom. Yeah. Right? So and I think that's the my intention behind everything, the freeing of humanity on all levels. And so until we own our own mind, we're not free. And most of us associate freedom with doing whatever you want, whenever you want. That's not freedom. Freedom is escaping the tyranny of the finite conditioned mind and limiting body consciousness. That's freedom. And that's what I'm interested in for humanity. And so the, the book, Change Your Mind, is a step-by-step, -step, repeatable, robust process to bring the subconscious into the conscious mind. And then once what is buried is, is brought to light, if it no longer serves you, then you can delete it just like an unwanted uh, program off your computer. And each time you delete one of these programs that have been implanted into our brain, more and more freedom is realized. And then eventually we will own our own mind and therefore our life becomes ours finally. There's a great spiritual, well, you don't, I know you don't use the word spiritual, um, but in my vocabulary, I'll, I'll just stick to the spiritual word but we'll come back around to that again in a second there's a great spiritual saying that to, to to change the world you change yourself and therefore the world changes around you and that's really fundamentally what you're saying in gaining the freedom isn't it yeah i mean it's absolutely true if you want to awaken all the world awaken all of yourself and that's how it actually works so and I'm, there the overwhelming majority of our behavior, and I, I would actually put it somewhere along the lines of 99.9% .9 of our thoughts, emotions, actions, and behaviors are not authentic to who and what we are. It's it's that severe. It's that extreme. And so liberation, self-realization, liberation, and we can use those things synonymously, it does not occur until you fully and completely own your own mind. And the only way to own your own mind is to investigate what is driving your behavior? What is the core motivation between your thoughts, emotions, actions, and behaviors? And until we understand that, then it isn't our life. It's it's someone else's or something else's. And so that's this why uh, this is the second book because it's it's paramount. It's absolutely paramount. And we don't understand, hence subconscious, we don't understand what's been programmed into our mind. Because it's been programmed into our mind. We actually think this is just how it is. It's not. 
It's not how it is. And so the book, the book will reveal that when we do those exercises. Right. We'll talk, we'll talk specifically about what those exercises are shortly, but, and, and again, I don't want to overthink this, but I'm, 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 I'm um, aware of, uh, of, of those people that I, I, you know, I really want them to buy the book because quite frankly, having started, the exercises in the book it's it is it's brilliant i mean in terms of just really getting in there and shoveling stuff out and making you become more aware of oh yeah okay right this, this program that i'm running is this is not the one i want to be running and in fact in one instance i discovered that the, the very r triggers of what i was reacting against was because i didn't want to be controlled mm. and yet of course, I am being controlled. <laughs> you got uh, it. We, yeah. <laughs> go on, over, the, over to you. Go yeah, on. for sure. I mean, the controller is controlled, right? It can be no other way. The controller is controlled, and we don't realize it. We don't realize it. And like I said, there's no freedom of liberation until we bring these things to light. And... 95% of reality creation comes from your subconscious mind. So our rational thinking mind, Tim, 5% of your life that you create for yourself, right? Only 5% of it comes from your thinking mind. Just think about that for a second. And that's why I say it's a limitation program that runs by thinking because the limitations are buried in the subconscious. So until they're brought to light, there is no freedom. There is no liberation. There's no way to create the life that we're all capable of. And that, that's why this work is so important. The, the life that we're all capable of is you summarize, I've got so many notes here. You summarize it at one point. This is what you're referring to, which is you, you say in the book, you're, this, this couple of sentences, living at the behest of the subconscious programmed egoic mind is the inversion and the perversion of what you really are. It robs you of what is your innate peace, completeness, divinity, freedom, and power to create without limitation. And, and that's the freedom that you're trying to give to everybody. You're trying to enable everybody to understand and grasp. That's it. That's it right there. If you pick, you pick the right uh, couple of sentences. That's, that's the whole thing right there. We're, we're a fractal of God. And last I checked, God doesn't have any limitations and neither do we. So if we're rubbing up against limitations and resistance, it's because these are programs that have been put into our mind that we're not bringing into our conscious mind. And therefore, we keep running these programs of scarcity, lack, separation, duality. And this is, this is the kind of life that we end up manifesting. We have an abundance of lack, an abundance of scarcity. And a, an abundance of the idea that everything is outside of you. And uh, I want better for humanity. So, <laughs> uh, A fractal of God, that's a really nice way of putting it. I've not actually heard that before. I suppose that's exactly what's said in we were created in his likeness, I suppose. But You, you got that's, it. That's, that's exactly right. Sentience, which is a, what I call a divine intelligence, which is our level of love and wisdom, who subsets our talents and abilities. And that sentience, the I am, the fractal of God is given energy to create with. And that's the energy that we use to think, to emote, to animate our body, to create experiences. Now, that's exactly what God is. God is sentience, given energy in order to create. And we are the exact same thing. And that's actually what it means to be made in God's image. It has nothing to do with a body or some guy with a white beard or whatever, right? It's sentience given energy to create. And that's what it means to be created in God's image. I know you've described this as, you, you know, you want to give people their freedom. You want to give people their power and uh, allow, that, that allow them to discover their own power. Mm -hmm. And what and how you describe it as being a fractal of God? That's a huge statement. That's no, that's a big, that's a big, that's a big thing, isn't it? I mean, that's a huge thing to grasp. And people will be what some people are going to be watching and say, "RJ, what the heck are you talking about?" <laughs> because because they're just not in that space yet to be able to have that door open in front of them. What? How do you work with people like that? What What do you say to people like that? That that actually are not ready for what you're saying. 
Well, the interesting thing is, Tim, is that the people that aren't ready for what I'm saying don't seem to ever get whiff of RJ. So they don't hear about me. They don't hear about the books. They don't hear about the courses. So the, the universe kind of takes care of that. So I don't really have to do anything for the people that aren't ready to work with these teachings. I, I can tell you this. At some point, they're going to need these teachings like they need air. Now, if they don't need it in this lifetime, maybe it's the next one or another one. But eventually, every, everyone will be working with these teachings because this is this is the way. This is the wisdom that transcends knowledge. These are the teachings that humanity is going to be using to take itself to the next level of, a, of its own evolution. So those that aren't ready, I have nothing to say to them because they're not ready. And that's okay. It's absolutely okay. And those that are ready are here. They're moved by the work. They're moved by their own transformation. They're moved by, they've always felt that there's a lot more possible for them. And now they, they're finally, uh, they've gotten a hold of the keys to the kingdom in terms of how to do it. So I never even consider people that are not ready. I'm not here for the people that aren't ready. So. And, and there's no, no, no. It's a, in a way, it's a dumb question because actually it, it, it echoes the, the, the basic misunderstanding of the way our experience mm. as what we are works. So because you know, you've just highlighted the fact that no, that people are, that are not ready for you are not going to find you. Why would they? What would be the purpose of that? Yeah. So, right. So in fact, so therefore what we can say is that everybody that is watching this at this stage is ready for what you have to say to them and for how they can step on in exactly the direction that they want to go in. They just don't know it yet because they haven't read your book or followed your practice. Tell me about the some of the very practical and simple methods that you hi how, highlight in your book about really trying to uncover that subconscious programming and, and getting it out there and dealing with it. Yeah, the key, the key is the first part of the book. The book is, as you know, is kind of divided into, it's almost like three books in one. <clears throat> it's going to meet the real you, maintain the real you, and express the real you, right? So meeting the real you has to do with the deprogramming because the human, the human personality, the human character, from my direct experience, is so far from what we really are. It, it's, um, it's a tragic comedy if Shakespeare were, were here. He would say it's a tragic comedy that we're so far from what we really are. So for me, it's it's about the self-control and self-discipline that is that is brought through adhering to the teachings, the the protocols and the principles of the book of, of uncovering what is your core motivation behind what you're doing and why you're doing what you're doing. That's really the key to just start to discover why am I really doing this? Why am I acting this way? Why am I thinking this way? Right. Is this really are these desires really authentic to me? Or are these things that have been pro, or are they things that have been programmed, which they are things that have been programmed into my mind? Now, this is part of why we're so unsatisfied with our experience here, Tim. This is part of the reason why, because we're leading a life that has nothing to do with who and what we really are. Right. And then we misidentify ourself with this form, this biological garment that's draped over the I am, the sentience. So we identify with this. And as soon as we identify with this, we identify with body, what I call body consciousness, five senses, the data stream that comes in is just the puny little intellect. Now we've reduced ourselves to some logic and, line and linearity program. And then we become a consumer rather than a creator. And that's that's why we we feel very unsatisfied. We're a consumer here. We're consuming beliefs, concepts, ideologies, so called so called knowledge, substitute gratifications for the immeasurable I am. And so I want humanity to start working from my perspective properly and optimally by going within and discovering the treasure within, instead of constantly reaching for a distraction as a substitute gratification because we're in such misery and suffering. It's um, yeah, it's it's it, it, yeah. I mean, I I'm I'm smiling because I I, I um, just you know I, I as, as you as you as you develop and and as one develops and changes one's perception of of everything, um, and you you kind of, you touch on this in different ways in the book as well. Um, 
then you know you we realize as we move forward actually how insignificant this is the the draped bodysuit and the fact that this is that vibration and therefore everything hinges on the vibration and the resonance that the real I am is functioning at if we can access it if the closer we can get to it I think in our last interview you described it as getting just getting closer and closer to that I am that true essence that is and therefore functioning at that level and enabling that resonance to change which is really what the whole process is about um I, I was thinking that uh, one of the things that we've got right now in our well in my experience external experience is quite a lot of oppression um occurring and seemingly ramping up um oppression on um preventing the release of the the um even the human identity um you know reducing its ability to speak for itself uh, that seems to be a kind of a theme that's occurring whether or not that's happening in your experience of reality i'm not i don't know and would be interested to know but there's but an aspect of this that that crosses my mind is that um there was a comment from somebody about the last conversation was that um free spirited 66 actually left a comment saying the more you get closer to detachment because we talked a lot about detachment last time the more you get closer to detachment the more the ego mind fights back for control and makes itself more obvious. Now, to me, the way that a lot of the forces around us are exercising themselves at the moment, they are clamping down. And that's like the ego fighting back, trying mm -hmm. to maintain the status quo. Is that is that how you would kind of perceive that sort of ongoing battle? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. I think that's a great analogy. I mean, that's that's what we're seeing here. It's literally what's going on inside us is reflected back in our so-called outer world. The, the, I think the key thing to understand about this, Tim, that all of us are an unlimited immortal creator, just, just like God's source. Unlimited immortal creator. Now, the only way the only way to stop an unlimited immortal creator is to make each and every one of these unlimited immortal creators stop themselves. And that's what subconscious programming is. That's the voice in the head. Now, if we can all step back for a second and really, and really look at that and really look at that. We start to understand that the ego mind identity is the matrix itself, that we stop ourselves, the harsh inner critic, our inner judgment. We are the ones that are stopping ourselves. And you see how insidious and brilliant this actually is. So not only do we hold ourselves in bondage, we then do it to everybody else. And so by uncovering these limiting beliefs, the voice in the head, right? When we start to uncover the root cause of these things and we see it clearly, we can delete it. And as we delete each one of these programs, like an unwanted program upon the computer, there is an inner shift. And that inner shift relates to what you were just talking about, about a higher frequency, a higher vibration. More of the I am is now present. And that, for me, vibrational engineering, our, our reality is formed based upon our vibration. It's not formed any other way. There's, there's, there's nothing here, Tim. There's nothing here, Tim. It's just like undifferentiated stem cells. The very first cells, right? When a, when a, a human is being created, undifferentiated, pure potential. Pure potential, right? It then relies upon desire and intention to give it the direction. Everything here, to me, and I realize I'm out of my mind. Everything here, to me, there's nothing here. It's all undifferentiated stem cells. And I create it based upon my vibration and my desire and intention and then where I place my attention. It's all pure potential. And what actually creates the reality is our vibration. And the more that we can attune ourselves to our true signal, the, e the EMI, the electromagnetic interference from a purely physics perspective, the ego mind identity is electromagnetic interference. It's everything that's being broadcast here, which takes us off our own signal, which is why we create a life that is not representative of this unlimited creator being that we actually are. 
So when we start to work with ourselves, as I, as I say, we start to work with ourselves properly, we start to realize that we can do anything, including unparalyzing ourselves, create what kind of reality that we want for ourselves, manifest whatever it is that we desire, because it is, it's part of what we actually are. And we have been convinced through the harsh inner critic that we can't do these things. It's impossible. And as I said, the only way to stop an unlimited immortal creator being is to make them stop themselves. And this book is the treasure map that allows you to go to the source point, the unlimited nature of who and what we are, and gives exercises and protocols about how to unleash this real you. And then we own our own mind, and then we can create heaven on earth, which is which is what we're always destined to do. Are you able to, um, do you feel, do you want to describe that um, diarizing exercise? It's, it's such a brilliant exercise. Yeah, I can give, um, yeah, I mean. I mean, like the, the brushing of the hair is the one that you started with. That's a classic, you know, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's how the whole thing started. So uh, I'm trying to remember what year this was, but um, it, it was roughly 13 years ago or 15 years ago. It was, it was something like that. Uh, <clears throat> at the time, I could tell, it was driving me mad, to be honest. I could tell that my life wasn't wasn't my own. I could feel it. I, I knew that these desires and the way that I was leading my life, this, this is not me. And I could feel it. And to me, it felt like something slithering around my brain, af affecting everything, affecting my thought process, affecting what it is that I desire. All these things, my entire life didn't feel like my own. And I would have done anything. And I mean it, I would have done anything to liberate myself, to reach self-realization. So the idea came to me that I, I have to get rid of these limiting programs that are buried so far deep in my subconscious mind because this is what's driving my behavior. I can feel it. I can feel it. So I decided to take two weeks off of work. And instead of obviously going on vacation, I decided to become self-realized. So I, I started to do this change your, the change your mind, the protocols. But I, I knew that if I simply traced my core motivation to why I'm doing what I'm doing, I would then discover whether or not this desire was authentic to me or something or someone else. And so the very first morning, very first morning, I woke up, I slept with my notebook. I did slept with my notebook and my pen. So I got up, it was like 4.30 in the morning, right? I had to go to the bathroom. So I get up, take my notebook and pen with me. And I walk into the bathroom and I, I just catch it. <clears throat> excuse me, I just catch a glimpse of my reflection in the bathroom mirror. Now, completely and utterly unconsciously, I just automatically reached for a brush and started brushing my hair. No thought process, nothing. It's just totally unconscious action, just doing this. And it dawned on me like, whoa, what is going on here? Why am I even doing this? I didn't even think about doing it. I'm just doing it like an automaton. What is going on here? So I stopped. I stopped and I literally opened up my notebook <clears throat> and I wrote down brushing my hair. And then I started questioning it. Why am I brushing my hair? And the first answer I got is because it's a mess. Now, that's not a core motivation. That's a justification. It's a justification, right? And this is where most of humanity will stop in terms of self-inquiry. They ask themselves one thing, they get some kind of juicy justification, and then they just move on. Nowhere near good enough. Nowhere near good enough right? Because my hair is a mess. Why do I care? So I asked myself again, why do I care if my hair is a mess? And the answer I got is because I want other people to find me attractive. I remember this is like 4.30 in the morning, right? So it's like, as soon as that came to me, because I want other people to find me attractive, I knew I was onto something. I was like, oh, I'm starting to get in there. I'm starting to get in there. 4.30 in the morning by myself in the dark brush on my hair. Why would anyone do that unless they're programmed to do it, right? So, because I want other people to find me attractive. And now it's the next question where we, the next time we go a little deeper, this is the key, right? All it takes is a little bit of courage and a little bit of honesty. So then I ask myself, why do I care if other people find me attractive? Why do I care? And the answer I got is because I get a sense of my own self-worth through other people's opinion of me. I, in that second, there was a gigantic inner shift. Gigantic. It's like the, the I am just went. And a program within my mind got deleted. Just got deleted. And I could feel it. I became like a like a wild man. I knew 
then in two weeks, I'm going to delete all these things. And all I did was, was investigate what would seem like a completely and utterly meaningless activity or behavior, brushing your hair, right? Things that we do all day long with no thought process. Wait till you see what you discover in terms of why we do these things. And that was the first thing. That was the very first one. And that was all I needed to continue to do it for, for two weeks. It's quite a demanding uh, process that, that once you start it, um, you know, and, and you say all it takes is a little bit of courage and a little bit of honesty. Mate, I think I think you better change the way you address that. I think, <laughs> I think, I think it requires a lot of courage and a lot of honesty. I, I really do. I mean, you, you must have seen people from all over with all sorts of issues doing this exercise and seeing the amount of racking of the egoic self that takes place when you're doing it. Yeah, the the uh, little bit of honesty, a little bit of courage, right? So the, the reason why I, I frame it that way, Tim, is because it's this is just you. Right. You don't have to put on this for somebody else. You're not, you know, you're not talking to your mom, your dad, a therapist. You're not in front of a big room. Right. Where, you know, we kind of, oh, I don't know if I can be honest. This, this is just you in a notebook. That's all it takes. And the right questions. That's all it takes. Why do I feel this way? Why do I think this way? That's so that's why I kind of I, I totally understand what you're saying. But that's why I frame it that way, as a, as opposed to these other circumstances where that might be totally overwhelming for people, right? A, a big room, the therapist, the this or that, whatever. Yeah. Courage, dedication, honesty, right? Once you have that, I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing that you can't do. And you're simply just asking yourself, why do I think this way? Why do I feel this way? And every time you get to the core motivation, you will tangibly experience more of what you are. Every time. And as soon as what I found, <clears throat> not just with myself, with all these people that I've, thousands of people that I've done this with, as soon as they start to taste it, Tim, they become ravenous. Mm -hmm. Ravenous. Because the, the limitations are starting to leave and the, the, the power and the freedom of what we really are starts to become more and more tangible. And then once you taste that authenticity, nothing inauthentic will ever satiate you again. And that's why the programmed egoic mind starts to lead because it's not good enough anymore. It's not good enough anymore. And as soon as we taste just a little bit, and that that's really the key, to just be honest and courageous enough to, to get a taste of the truth, and then that's the only thing that will ever satiate you. And and yeah, I mean, and one of the things is that um, there's a there's a danger that people might think, well. Um, you know that's a that's a huge step. This what what they're talking about from where I am now to to this fractal of God. That's a massive step. Um, I'm not going to see a change uh, for a long time. But that's not true, is it? It's not even close to being true. It's not even close to being true. We we all are the I am. We all are the fractal of God. All of us, right? It's just that our attention has been on everything other than that. And these exercises bring your attention back onto who and what you really are. And when people say to themselves, torturing themselves with their own imagination, when people say to themselves, I'm so far from that, this is going to be so difficult. This, 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 that's a singular perspective. That's not what is. That is an energetic placeholder is how I like to call it, Tim. So it's a singular perspective. We're putting our energy on this one singular perspective. And making that out to be the end-all be-all. It's just a singular perspective. Take that energy and put it on something else. Then all of a sudden, that 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 singular perspective that you had a moment ago is gone. And then no longer has any gravitas. So that's that's all that is. None of us are far. None of us are far from this. That's why it's 14 days. I mean, think about it. 14 days. I didn't say 14 years, right? And say you gotta you gotta come live with RJ. For 14, right? Like old school, sit with the guru, whatever, you know, whatever. Not 14 days being dedicated and honest. The liberation is tangible. And we are always the I am, Tim. There's no such thing as being far away from that. It's an energetic placeholder on a singular perspective that we then give so much authority to, which then gives it gravitas, 
over our mind and body of energy, which is why it seems like such a big deal. Just take that attention off that energetic placeholder and put it somewhere else and watch, watch how this, oh, it's so difficult. So watch how it just disappears. One of the things that uh, I think uh, sometimes people get attracted by with this okay, metaphysical path uh, is the possibility of the way that reality can really start to do some very interesting things when we when we now shift our perspective on subtle energy and um, you know we see how intangible and how uh, very um, very manipulable or oh, manipulable what's the word uh, you know it, it can be changed how how very easily this reality can be changed so these are some of the the wow experiences that can occur on this path do you think there's a danger that people get misdirected by the the that wowness that theater that again is simply part of us creating but we're readjusting our vibration well it that's a great question so i would just say that it, it just depends uh whose hands are are uh driving the the bus of, of these teachings so in other words when the ego mind identity gets a hold of true i mean this is this is what's happened to freemasonry this is what's happened to some of these uh powerful esoteric teachings maybe someday we'll talk about the origin of those esoteric teachings who created them why they were why they were given to humanity and how they've been misused how they've been misused so you take enough vitamins it'll kill you you drink enough water you'll drown okay so it's just about who is the one that has their hands on it is it going to be used for low frequency egoic purposes or are these teachings this esoteric wisdom going to be used for liberation and it always comes down to that. There's nothing anyone can do, including myself. There's nothing anyone can do to prevent it from landing in the hands of someone who wants to use it in a low frequency, a low frequency, uh, egoic way to benefit uh, 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 the one or the few, right? But the same teachings will either liberate you or they'll actually bring you further entrenched into into your own your own egoic mind. That has nothing to do with the teachings, and that that's always been a a bit of a sore point for me because it's one thing to to give grand right, right. grand teachings and then it, it depends on who's going to be driving the bus once they get their hands on it so okay so Okay, um, so I'll ask the question because you do you do you, um, you, uh, you you would expect me to. I, I want to ask the question. So the I can't phrase the question that I want to ask. The in recognizing the power of the teaching, in recognizing the power of what we're talking about here, and the significance of what we're talking about, and recognizing that actually some of the people that you that will learn from you won't benefit in the way that you would like them and know that they could benefit how does that make you feel is the end of that question but i think i know exactly what you're going to say yeah that i can't uh, as much as i try to do everything i can every time i'm here give my best be the best servant i possibly can be um, there's nothing I can do about that. There's a reason why these things were held within secret societies, because it was supposed to be preserved for those that would honor it. But of course, these secret societies get infiltrated. And then they use it for low frequency ego uh, purposes for the benefit of the one or just the few. Right. There's nothing I can do about that. The most important thing is to put these teachings back in humanity's hands and then humanity is going to do what they want with it. And there's nothing else I can do about that. I, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that when they see me, uh, they see an embodiment of the wisdom, an embodiment of the teachings, and they want to operate and live, quote unquote, like that. They want to, they want to be able to use it properly. And hopefully that's part of being here is the embodiment of the teachings and, and seeing someone walk the walk, not just talk the talk. 
Mm. And it's, I mean, and fundamentally, it is really basically saying that at all times we're trying to live from that perspective of the I am, which is which is fundamentally love. So it's compassion in all things at all times. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. 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 But we're all human too. How do you address that, though? Okay. Go on. All right. So when we say, okay, when we say I'm only human or something like that, okay, that drives me nuts. Okay. When we say I and only, there's nothing only about the I am. Okay. Why would we quantify ourselves and spell ourselves into some limitation by saying I am only such and such or oops, I did it again. I am only human. This is nonsense. We have to watch the spell that we're putting over ourselves by the words that we say. We absolutely have to watch that. So for me, when people do that, I'm like, why are you saying that to yourself? Does that make you, does that make you feel expansive, more powerful, lighter and freer when you say that? And then if it doesn't, then why say it? Then why say it? So that's that's what I mean. So I get carried away here, Tim. So, but the the only, there's no only to you, Tim. There's no only to you. There's no only to me. There's no only to God. It's everything. So we have to be incredibly mindful, because it's a pet peeve of mine. We have to be incredibly mindful about how we spell ourselves. Right. Right. Because otherwise we're not stepping into it at all. We are right. we are denying it. You got it, hundred percent. That's it. Yeah, right. <laughs> God, I love it. Uh, right. Um, could we just go back over some of the comments that were left after our last conversation? Sure. If you're yeah. okay with having a look at some of these. Um, uh, it's, it's uh, like I said right at the start. It's, it, that last conversation went down really, really, really well. Uh, a lot of people found you for the first time and were like blown away, which is brilliant. So I'm just pampering your egoic self here for the moment. <laughs> just a second. <laughs> okay. So um, right, uh, Neva two seven two seven six four. Neva two seven six four says, "Wow, I'm halfway through and I stopped the video to comment. This resonates so much. I had a wrong planet feeling for twenty years without knowing why. I tried to fit in and it nearly destroyed me physically." She says other stuff. She left jobs and she was she got me and got really sick and stuff. And she says, "I'm really struggling with the healing process, knowing what to do but not doing it, and then beating myself up." This interview, she says, after other stuff, she says, this interview is a perfect reminder to not focus as much on the outside world, no matter how tumultuous it may be. But I just wondered whether you had a, a, a comment at all, RJ, on that sort of feeling that, you know, when people are really struggling with the healing process, we all do sometimes. Yeah. The, so the analogy I used, Tim, is that uh, most of us associate using our will and our energy is our will using our will to to fight right to overcome to fight and and that's absolutely right uh, many many times that is what we use our will for to fight through challenges whether personal community you know global right and interplanetary so we use our will to fight but I, i've often found that at a certain uh level of consciousness or evolution of a specific individualized aspect or what we call soul is that the highest use of the will is to actually put your shield down and stop fighting. Now, that's the real challenge. Most of us, like I said, swing the sword and fight, right? No, no. At a certain point, we have to be able to not just swing the sword, but be able to put the shield down. No more resistance because it's the ego mind that's resisting. Right. That, that's all that is. We create resistance, Tim. There's no resistance to anything. There's no resistance to anything. We create it. It's all one thing. There is no resistance. So when we start to get comfortable, put it as the analogy, right, putting the shield down. Surrender. Now, the energy drops down, literally drops down. And I know these eyes don't see it, but we can see these things. The energy drops down. Now, once the energy drops down, there's no resistance. 
and now we can flow right into the ascend the frequencies healing technique or what or or whatever whatever it is now we can flow because the energy we now have control of it through the surrender and that's really the first step uh, humility it takes you it takes you it takes real humility and most of us we're so used to swinging that sword fighting our way through and i get it i get it but healing you don't heal that way that is not how healing actually works it's not how healing works so if everyone can just put put the put the shield down and you'll reclaim your energy and now you can do what you want with your energy this is a little bit like where you talk in the early part of the, this book about the differences between responding and reacting. Yeah, the the reacting is 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 predictive. It's a program, right? So that's not you. That is your pattern, subconscious, egoic mind that simply reacts, right? Respond is the I am. The real you, the true you, however, however you want to say that. That's what responds. Reacts means you don't have any control. If you react to something, right, you're powerless. You've been disempowered because you're controlled. Because you're controlled. We were talking about earlier, the controller is controlled, period. And that's what the reactionary state is, right? So when you're in a residing or marinating within the true self or the I am, you will be able to respond. And it becomes very, very difficult for anything or anyone to get a to get a reaction out of you. It's just not there because you are now in control of yourself. Yeah. And you also talk about the differences between acceptance and allowance. Yeah, that's a acceptance is such a spiritual buzzword. Ugh. Okay. Right. Have to accept this. Have to accept that. Accept him. Accept her. Right. Why would we? Why would we want to accept a reality that is completely and utterly abhorrent to you? Why would you want to accept that? Right. That doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. So if we if we feel into the word, Tim, if we feel into the word acceptance. Okay. My hands automatically do that. And we can feel this. That's why it's metaphysics. It's the truth. So when you say accept, there is a contraction. There is a solidification and there's a contraction, right? That's not what is. That's not what is. Okay. Now, when we say allow, allowance, same thing with my, I know I talk with my hands, right? But that this is what happens to the energy. Allowance, feel that. That's what is. Expansion. That's what is, not contraction. So we don't want to accept and solidify a reality that is discordant, but allow it to be, allow it to be. And when you allow things to be, you will start to be able to perceive all the other possibilities that are available to you because you haven't collapsed yourself into one agreed upon reality that is discordant to you. So acceptance, while a spiritual buzzword, is metaphysically absolutely incorrect. Absolutely incorrect. Allowance is the key. Because allowance is that active process. It is literally allowing the next moment to be what it wants to be to, yeah right exactly okay cool it's a great it's a really interesting it really struck me that as really one of the like yeah of course that was a real dull oh, moment <laughs> yeah <Sorry>. yeah <laughs> there, there are a lot of those in the book it's great love it um so i so oh, sorry i'll go back to these comments because um uh now i there was a few people that actually um i know it's it's not I mean, it is appropriate to your current book because actually it's talking about um, narcissistic behavior. And there was a couple of people there that were saying that um, uh, got really excited thinking RJ was going to talk about his teaching on narcissism. But um, this person, Mystic Thread 2957, says it's their favorite teaching so far. Um, 
and somebody else agrees and says yes that's the that's the uh, the first time that they heard rj talking about um anything they were, he was talking about narcissistic um, attitudes and narcissism he, and this person says it was life changing that comment was left uh, four months ago and then they came back uh, a month ago and said well mission accomplished in my life and so much more i got the last thing i expected after i awakened unconditional love from the narcissist in my life truly a miracle they say uh, i did not know that was possible so what i know this might be a real sidetrack but what's the teaching that you talk about narcissism narcissists and, and that yeah well i i try never to and that i try never to i don't give a humanistic interpretation or presentation of uh what it is that i experience tangibly right and the whole key uh or point of me being here is to not offer a humanistic perspective but to offer a higher consciousness enlightened pers perspective of things so so i don't have the standard uh dsm3 definition of a narcissist right but i can tell you what's really going on once we pierce the, the into the veil of wisdom so a, a true narcissist OK, is not the same as you or me or about uh, roughly about half the population. So how I describe it is we talked about the I am. Right. OK. It's a totally different genre of being. The real narcissists are a totally different genre of being. And instead of me doing that whole teaching, the, the short version of of it is there are high, we are projections of our higher self. Right. OK. So there's billions of higher selves and there's different genres of higher selves, the higher selves that it's all based upon how sentient they are and sentience and energy is in a one-to-one -one ratio. So certain higher selves project pieces of themselves based upon their own evolution. And then the physical suit matches up with their level of their level of sentience and energy. So all that to being said is narcissists are in between animal and human alien. There are actually a whole category. There are a whole category, hence the lack of empathy, the you know the the, the psychopathy, uh, pedophilia. They're able to they're able to uh, operate in a way that about half the population just can't do that. They can't do that. They can because it's a it's a different genre of being. It's literally a different genre of being. Just above the higher selves that project pieces of themselves into the physical suit that we would call an animal. Mm. Just above that. Just above that. And yeah. beneath the genre of higher selves that typically project aspects of themselves into the vehicles that we would call human or alien. And this is when we start to really see this, it, it becomes rather obvious and it, it brings together so much of the, I'll just call it humanistic information that we have about them. <clears throat> it is a different genre of being with a different amount and quality of sentience, which allows them to operate in the way that they operate. And they're essential in terms of creating enough uh disharmony that all of us have to go within to evolve ourself so they're actually here to cause disharmony and soak up the matrix so everyone else can go within liberate themselves and move on and, and ascend the frequency so that's part of instead of me going on and on that's part of the teachings of uh what i see when i look at a narcissist it's literally a different genre of being that's that's a really interesting perspective um and it begs several different questions, but I, I, I'll come back to one that I want to ask you directly related to that. I'll kind of circle back around to that in a second. The, the other one that from last conversation that I wanted to touch on uh, is because there were a few people, and this is a very humanistic comment, right? This is a very human-based comment. This is coming back around to your, your um, healing yourself. Now, you must get a lot of um, ne'er sayers, ne'er doers, or whatever you might want to call them. Um, now, this person actually is not a um, a critic in a kind of a blatant out and out way. I, I kind of know her a little bit. She leaves a lot of comments on the channel. She's been a follower for some time, and I kind of understand where she's coming from. Um, but what she what she was saying was. Um, it, she, she was talking about your spinal infection and the, the incident that you had there in the hospital from which, you know, you, you worked your way um, back to health. She says, now, a spinal infection and crushed spine are two completely different things. I think you, you had said the last time that you had a crushed, a part of your spine had been crushed. 
Um, she says, I'm a combat veteran, someone who knows an actual quadriplegic from literal crushed spine and people with severed arms, which they cannot regrow heal, no matter how in touch they are with their raw, authentic, non-physical self. Now, I know this is quite a low energy kind of mm -hmm. comment here, right? But we'll mm -hmm. work through it. Sounds like he was treated quickly. When treated, spine infections heal within one month to six months. Um, if you get a spinal infection, the doctor will consider you a quadriplegic for that short time temporarily. But when treated with antibiotics and sometimes surgery, you'll heal fast. It's great that he's trying to sp spread his personal perspective and reality, but he's not qualified to tell actual quadriplegic, quadriplegics or amputees that they can heal themselves physically. Healing and manipulation of our physical reality does exist, but usually not in such extremes. His was not an extreme healing, but was quite common. Now, I, I wanted to raise that with you because I want to simply clarify that I'm quite happy that you were classified as um, quadriplegic in that time in hospital when you were suffering from all of the sepsis, all of the, all of the different things that you were suffering from, and your spinal infection was part of that package that you were your physical body was undergoing. You don't dispute, I'm kind of answering this for you at this stage, but I'm, I'm gonna let you speak in a sec. You don't dispute the fact that there might be other people with spinal infections um, could be healed fairly efficiently and quickly by the mainstream medical practice without doing the work, the inner work that you went through. But you had to go through with the work that you did in order to pull yourself through and go through that experience so that you could step on and be the person, the thing, the energy, the vibration that you are now. Do, do you, I'm not really giving you anything to speak about there. I think what she's saying is what you went through wasn't as bad as you make out it to be. But Inter I, interesting. Okay. So <laughs> interesting perspective. Uh, I was told I'll never walk again. It's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. Uh, I, I had a litany of things that were wrong with me. I was told they had 48 hours to live. I was suffering from life-threatening conditions of autonomic dysreflexia. I mean, th it, there was literally a page of things that were wrong with me. When uh, my friend who wrote the forward for the book would look at the blood work, he would literally say, there's no way you should be alive just looking at this blood work. It's absolutely impossible. So if someone wants to diminish the whole thing, if that makes them feel better, if they want to hold on to whatever it is they want to hold on to, I, I couldn't care less. I couldn't care less. I know what I did. I know what I was told. I was told it was impossible. I was in complete another agony. And it wasn't just paralysis. No, that's fine. I mean, actually, um, it, it, interestingly, and because I, I don't want to keep going down this lower energy stuff, because um, I wanted to raise it because I said I would. I would ask you because that's I felt obliged to. That's not a good thing. Um, but uh, what was I going to say? Oh, detachment is what you've just demonstrated. Yep. Right. So it's just like the news, right? I was I was paralyzed before surgery, paralyzed after, right? So it's just like everything that you're told, like that person. So if that person would have would have walked in or if the doctors walked in, hey, this is the situation. You can't get better. Look at your MRI. This is the way it is. I've done 10,000 of these surgeries. People don't get better. That's just the way it is. Sorry, sorry to tell you. The, the diseases that you have, you can't overcome these things. These are genetic. There's nothing you're going to be able to do about these things. These life-threatening conditions that you're, there's there's no medication for these things. The autonomic dysreflexia is just part of when you have an injury at a certain, right? I didn't believe a word of it. Completely and utterly detached because I know there's no limitations. Unlike your friend who wrote the comment, I know there's no limitations. So it didn't matter what they said to me. And they told me it was impossible. It's absolutely impossible. The neurosurgeon's fantastic. He's like, I've been doing these for 20 years. You can't get better. That's just the way it is. Right. So I know that there are, there is no such thing as impossible. I am tangibly aware that there's no such thing as impossible. So therefore, I'm detached from everyone else's limitation program. It means nothing to me, right? And in fact, one of the doctors used to say to me all the time, 
about they've been doing this for 20 years or 25 years, whatever it was. And this is the experience that I've had. Because I told everyone I was going to walk. I told them I'd do it in 100 days. I'm going to heal myself of everything. So they, they just thought in the beginning, they thought I was crazy. But then shortly thereafter, it completely changed, completely changed. But um, they would tell me, the, the doctors, the nurses, their history about all the people that they've treated in this, in this rehab facility, how none of them ever get better. None of them ever actually walk out of here, right? And they were trying to tell me, listen, you're a paraplegic. This is just the way it is. And I used to say, what does that have to do with me? What does your experience have to do with me? That's what I would say in the kindest way. But what does that have to do with me? And then, of course, well, I, well, nothing, I guess, Mr. Spina, but I, I just want to let you know what my experience is. I appreciate that, but that your experience has nothing to do with me. I don't operate that way. So once we start to work in this way, we won't have these low frequency limitations. We won't diminish. We won't, we won't have to judge. We won't have to say, well, it's impossible. According to who? Mm. According to who it's impossible. Mm. You know, maybe, is, maybe there one last thing, Tim. Maybe there are beings that come here over and over again and do the impossible every time they're here. So what do we say to them? Right? <laughs> so that's how I see that. <laughs> no, absolutely. I know. I mean it's brilliant because it's it actually is it, it it actually exemplifies and and illustrates and highlights or whatever the what these words are the the way that the individual point of awareness that we are can use its own rules and that's the whole point that's the whole point of the freedom that yep. you're talking about it's a it's like we are in our own universe our own cosmos and our rules are our rules so we better make sure that we're we know what our rules are. You didn't abide by the rules of somebody else's universe because what did it have to do with you? You were working to your own rules. I had a case a while ago where, um, this, is, this is a few years ago, uh, I was doing some work on a, a lady, on a client, that many people were saying that they had found that she'd got cancer. You are aware of your other aspects of self, your your more subtle presences. Presences <laughs> sounds like Golem or something, um, but you're aware of the, those beings that are with you all the time. If if we talk about you as a separate entity to them, which actually really you're not a separate entity at all. Yeah. So I was told by my entourage no she hasn't got cancer mm. right adamant mm. they were adamant mm. no she hasn't got cancer and i'm like i knew what this was this was a process of saying whatever decision is made will be the outcome of the reality right now unfortunately i didn't abide by their command instruction and the lady died mm. of cancer. Now, I accept that life and death is part of this, uh, you know, vibration and the resonance in which we all exist, and we are only here in the body suit, etc. But obviously, I have empathy for the lady for the you know, on a humanistic level. There's all of that, but as a teaching of the decisions that we make and the energy that we put into our reality and the incarnation of the reality is really, really important. These decisions that we make at each moment about what we believe can be exactly as you illustrate life changing. Tim, our reality is created by what we believe to be real and true. Period, end of story, full stop. That's it. Yeah. That's it. So if someone believes it to be real and true for them, whatever it is, whatever it is, it will be real and true for them. We're that powerful. We're that powerful. So when we remove the limit, when we realize it's all one thing, which means there are no limitations, there are no locks or bolts to anything, 
then we realize there's no such thing as impossible. And when you know that, then you're going to create your reality based upon that. And then you'll do the impossible every time you show up here over and over and over again to prove the truth that there are no locks and bolts to anything. It's all one thing. Everything is available. We create our reality by what we believe to be real and true. And that is exactly how it works. Period. End of story. So that's ex that, that's it. And once we know that, know that, not think that, know that we'll be able to do whatever it is that we desire. Thank you.